Hello, neighbor. Thank you for tuning in to the broadcast, Sounding Forth the Gospel again. Hi, my name is Pastor Eddie Hawks at Woodlawn Baptist Church. This is Sounding Forth the Gospel again. I appreciate you tuning in today to this uh, 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 broadcast here. And uh, matter of fact, we prayed before we went on the broadcast with Cable 12 here, and I appreciate these guys here and all that they do. Uh, I want to give you a couple of announcements here. Um, uh, at the end of the month here in August, uh, we will have a tent revival right there across from the fire department and rescue squad and, uh, well, fire department, police department, excuse me, and uh, right over there in that field. I think this may be our sixth or seventh year there. So I want to invite you out to that. Uh, we start Sunday night, uh, August 26th at 6 o'clock on Sunday night like we normally do on our church service. But then the rest of the week, Monday through Friday, we'll be meeting at 7 o'clock. We've got different speakers each night, and different singers each night. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll come and the uh, Lord will bless you with that. I'm looking and I'm excited about uh, being there. I'm going to preach one night. And uh, anyway, um, I've got some good preachers coming in. And, uh, and I want to invite you to that. That's the end of the month there, uh, the tent revival Right there, I call it Rocky Mount Tent Meeting. Amen. Rocky Mount Tent Meeting. So you make plans to come if you would, and uh, and I will say this that uh, uh, Cecil Hodges and, and, and CE there, I appreciate them allowing us to use that land right beside of them. I really do. I appreciate that. And then Jimmy Jones, he mows that whole land for us, and uh, and I appreciate him doing that too. It's a whole lot goes into getting that, and all and many of the men of the church. We'll meet that Saturday morning before that and put up the tent, and that's a good time of fellowship. And, uh, and then, of course, the Saturday after, we'll tear it down. That's a good time of fellowship, too. And uh, it's just a good week, and, uh, and I'm just inviting you to do that. So be sure you come out to that the last month, last of the month there in August. Amen. Uh, uh, also, uh, I, I just want to just say this. Uh, um, it just seems like here, and well, I know it ain't seemed like it, it has been, that uh, this preacher here has done a lot of funerals, and for uh, many people, uh, five, or, five of them at least from our church, and the other two is uh, somebody kin to somebody in our church. And uh, I tell you one thing, uh, um, it'll wear on a preacher, and, uh, and it'll also just wear on your church. And uh, you know what? You just got to get close to each other. I told our church the other night, that um, our church is uh, it's sensitive right now. And, and I told them, I said, this revival coming up in the tent, I think it's going to do us good. We're all sensitive to the needs of the people that's passed on and went on to heaven. And, uh, and it just breaks people's hearts here on earth. And, uh, and, uh, but I think that having revival uh, and getting the Word of God from different preachers, I believe it will strengthen us and maybe we'll get revived again and uh, maybe God will show up. We're, we're praying for that, amen. And, uh, and that's why I want you to come, amen. Be part of that, amen. And so uh, I want you to turn your Bibles, if you would please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, that's a great chapter that Paul writes about. I know that he's writing to the church of Corinth, and he founded that church. And, and uh, I'll say this, Now you may not agree with me, but uh, I think it's true, that uh, when you think of the book of Corinthians, you think of correction. He's always trying to correct the, 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 the folks in the Corinthian church. They're still going back, doing some things they used to do things like that. Now, if you want a doctrinal book, you go back up to the book of Romans. That is a very good doctrinal book. If you are a new Christian um, and uh, maybe you're listening to the broadcast or maybe want to start over, you begin with the book of John. It is a great, and then go to the book of Romans. But here in Corinthians, it's a correctional book. And as we get to 2 Corinthians, um, <clears throat> I want to look at a few things here, and then we got a message here. But, you know, 2 Corinthians has got a lot of verses in it. Uh, I'm going to read a few of them that leads up to verse 21. That's what we're going to be looking at today, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. But uh, there's a few verses there that leads up to it. You know, the Bible talks about that... Um, 
that we walk by faith and not by sight. That's in verse 7. And uh, we're confident and uh, rather willing, willing, he said, absent from the body is present with the Lord there in verse 8. Ain't that good? Uh, we walk by faith and not by sight. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. And then he says uh, in verse 10 that uh, we're all, it says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now he's talking to Christians right then that we may receive the things done in our body uh, according to what we have done, whether it be bad or good. And that's since you've been saved, amen. We're not going to be judged if you're going to get to heaven or hell then because this is for the Christian there. And, uh, and so we go on down. And then he talks about in verse 20, talks about, well, everybody knows, uh, well, pretty much, verse 17, he says, because of all this, that therefore, if any man be in Christ, verse 17, he's a new creature, amen. Uh, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know, I preached on that one time, and I got to get going on my message, but you know, you're thinking about verse 17. It says, all things are become new. I mean, all things. And we don't really look at that. I mean, all things supposed to be new. I mean, your walk, your talk, your look, your smell. I'm telling you, everything, uh, everything about you, your songs, amen, and uh, things like that, everything becomes new. And, uh, but then we get down to verse 20, and it says, Now then, we are in ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ did, be ye reconciled to him. Re reconciled to God. We ought to be reconciled because we're an ambassador for Christ. What's an ambassador, preacher? Uh, an ambassador is a representative of that king of that country. Oh, that makes me excited, praise God. I'm a representative of the King of kings and Lord of lords since I've been saved, amen. So I represent the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's got us that are saved. We're his ambassadors, amen, to go out and uh, represent his kingdom, amen. And that's what we ought to be doing instead of doing our own thing. But then we get to verse 21, and it says this, For he, talking about God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I want to read that again. For he hath made him to become sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. God, he hath made him, Jesus Christ, his son, to be come sin for us to be made he's he has been he made sin for us he took our sin on the cross he nailed it to the cross and i'm glad he came down here we celebrate jesus's birthday at christmas time when he was born in a manger he came down but he but he he didn't just start there he was already in heaven before the foundation of the world he was with god before the foundation of the world he was before all that. It was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Now, I can't explain everything about the Trinity, and, and I'm not trying to, but I do know I believe it. Amen. I believe that there's three in one. There's three people in one, but all of them also has a, a different identity or a entity, if I want to call it that. God the Father's got a, a thing that he does. Jesus, God the Son, has come to this earth, and God the Holy Spirit is here. Uh, and uh, comes into the believers. So uh, anyway, and so they're three and one, but that's called the Trinity. <coughs> and, uh, and so God said there, he said, for he hath made him to be sin for us. And I want to preach today, if I'm able to finish this message, since I've had so much introduction here, that Jesus dealt with the serpent for us. Jesus dealt with that old serpent called the snake or the serpent or I'm just going to say Satan, for us on the tree. Uh, you know, the New Testament teaches us that we're crucified with Christ. We've been, we died with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We were risen with Christ. And one day we're going to be ascended with Christ. And you know what? The Bible tells us and teaches us that I suffer with Christ. I died with Christ, and I was buried with Christ, and I made alive with Christ, and now I'm seated with Christ. Now, of course, I'm not in heaven yet, but my position, since I've been justified, I hadn't been glorified yet, I'm, I'm justified, and I'm just as if I'm in heaven now. Positionally, I'm already there. But my state right now is still on earth, 
and I'm an ambassador for Him. Amen. But because of all that, because I'm saved, because I'm an ambassador for Jesus, and I, and I, and I get to tell people about Jesus, it goes all the way back that Jesus became sin for us. He took our hell and He took our sin and He nailed it on the cross. And, uh, and I'd like to just give you a little study about that. Jesus Christ became what we were so that we might become what He is, righteous. Let me say that again. Listen, Christ became uh, what we were or what we are and that we might become what He is. And uh, so he came down from glory, and he came down here, and, he, and we celebrate his birth uh, in, on Christmas Day. Praise God. We call it Christmas. And then, and then he grew up, and 30 years later, uh, he starts his ministry. John the Baptist baptizes him. John says it on the Jordan River. He said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And uh, for three, three and a half years, he went about preaching and teaching and uh, doing miracles and things like that uh, first to the Jew and uh, to get people's attention, let him know that he was the Son of God. And, uh, and so, um, so that's what he done for us. I want to think about going all the way back to the beginning. We think about the beginning. The book of Genesis uh, gives us a vivid account of what went wrong with the human race. Man was created in, by God and in God's image in Genesis 1.27. The original man had no flaws whatsoever, physically or, no, or moral. He didn't have any flaws whatsoever. Adam was perfect, if you want to say that. Then Eve came along. Adam and Eve enjoyed fellowship with the holy God, praise God, because their nature was his nature. They were created in his image. It was a perfect perfect world at that time. That was the beginning. But then we come to the fall in Genesis. Uh, the honeymoon came to an end and it, the serpent came on the scene. Did you hear what I said? The serpent came on the scene. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. And so we notice in Genesis 1, God created heaven and earth, and he talks about all the seven days, and he rested. And then by the time Gen Genesis chapter 2, he talks about Adam and Eve. And then all of a sudden, Genesis 3, there's a new creature come on the scene beside Adam and Eve, and his, the name was, uh, it was a serpent. Next to man, the serpent was the keenest and the most beautiful creature it was. Now, you might not agree with me, but I don't think the serpent at that time uh, slithered on the ground like we see now. Uh, I don't think so whatsoever. I think that he may have walked upright. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Don't think I'm crazy because when he's cursed, he said that you will crawl on your belly the rest of your life. But, uh, but I know the serpent lent itself to Satan, and Satan first came unto him as the first angel of light. Amen? That first angel of light. You know, the Bible says that Satan is an angel of light. He'll come, and you think everything's good, but I'm telling you, he is a destroyer, and he is a destructioner, if I could say that. I don't know if there's a certain word. Search word is a destructioner, but I just invented that, amen, but it sounds like it. The serpent came to Eve, you remember that, as an indirect approach to the head of man, and that was Adam. He went around Adam, and he tried to say, well, I'm going to get Eve, and I'm going to see if I can get her to drop her guard, and he did. And the snake... You know, when you just say that word snake, he cast doubt. He casted doubt onto Eve. He said this in one time in Genesis 3. You shall not surely die in verse 4. Genesis 3, 4. You shall not surely die. He was da putting doubt in Eve's mind and heart. In chapter 2, God told them not to partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, of course, he came and he made it desire for her to look at and all that stuff and to look at. And then she partook of the fruit and then she gave it to her, her uh, husband, Adam. The climax of this fall, uh, of this episode was the fall. So the beginning, everything was great. And then the serpent come on the scene and the fall, we call it the fall of mankind, Adam and Eve there. And man misused his freedom and joined the fallen ranks of the rebel Satan. 
And so God kicked them out of the Garden of Eden and put a flaming sword and an angel right there at the door, uh, at the, excuse me, at the gate right there, if you want to call it, before you can get in there. And so the consequences, so we saw the beginning, we saw the fall, and now the consequences, the consequences of uh, Adam and Eve's fall. Everything changed at that time. Man lost his dominion over the earth because God had gave him dominion over the earth. A curse came. Now all of a sudden sin came in. Death came in. Suffering came in. Sickening, sick, sickening, sickness was the result of all this. None of that would happen before then. But before, because of the fall, the consequences, you know, when you even say the word sin, sounds like that sorry snake, amen, and Satan, all that things, I'm telling you. Man was banished from the Garden of Eden in the presence of God. I'm telling you, you get away from the presence of God, I'm telling you, you're in bad shape. Man had lost his moral likeness of God and inherited the nature of Satan. And I'm telling you, you may not understand this and may not like this neither, but I tell you, when you see a couple having a brand new baby, or maybe you got a grandbaby or whatever it may be, they're cute as a button. They're, uh, I mean, they are so cute. They're not as cute as my grandkids, but anyway, they're cute. And uh, I know that. Anyway, uh, but they are little, and you know what? They have what we call an Adamic nature. Now, don't cut me off here. They were born in sin because of Adam and Eve and the fall, the consequences that death was passed upon all men, uh, John 5, 21. And so, but, no, excuse me, John 5, 12, excuse me. And, uh, and so uh, because of that, every one of us has to grow up and when we get to the age of accountability, when you begin knowing right from wrong and you know that sin is wrong and, and you make a choice of sinning or not, then the Holy Spirit of God will, will woo you to Him. The Holy Spirit of God is the third part of the Trinity, as I told while, said a while ago. You've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And, the, and, and if you reject that and resist the Holy Spirit, you're still a sinner. But if you accept what Jesus done for you and died on the cross and you repent of your sin, you believe in Jesus, amen, and you ask Him to come in your life, and, uh, and you know what? He'll come in if you mean it, if you mean it, and then you become a Christian at that time. But you have to be changed, amen. So all of us are born sinners whatsoever. All of us need to be saved. The consequences is that like a snake, Adam and Eve were afraid of exposure. They were crouching and hiding from God. Remember, God had to, in the cool of the day, He said, he used to walk with Adam and Eve. Now he said, hey, Adam, where art thou? Where are you at? Where are you at? He tried to cover up their nakedness uh, and shame and hide from God. Their, the first works of salvation was there that they took fig leaves and tried to cover their, sin, cover their nakedness. They didn't even know they were naked because they were in a perfect world. And all of a sudden their eyes were open. Because he told them that. You partake of that tree, your eyes will be open, and you'll be as little gods. You'll be as gods. And, uh, and then they knew that they were naked. Now, they were likened unto the new father, the devil. John, uh, John, excuse me, John 8, 44 says, Ye are of your father, the devil. Now, I didn't say that. That's what Jesus said in John 8, 44. And so now, uh, a curse was pronounced on all the acting characters in the scene there of the fall. First, the curse was uh, the serpent. I'll just say to the serpent, he was cursed for cooperating with Satan. Uh, the first thing was man for his yielding to the uh, beguiled serpent. He, they yielded to the serpent. The ground, for Adam's sake, the ground is cursed for, the, for all the rest of our life that will work the ground and for the, with the sweat of our brows. The snake was sentenced to crawl on his belly and eat dust for the rest of its life. And that's why we see snakes on the ground. Man, I tell you one thing. I, I can't even stand a dead snake. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't even like to be around a rubber snake almost. I, I, it just, just gives me the heebie-jeebies, amen? <laughs> I'm telling you. Satan had, has now infiltrated the human race and became the prince of this world. See, Satan, even at that time, he was called Lucifer in heaven before the fall. And uh, he wanted 
he wanted to be like God, the Bible says, in Isaiah and Ezekiel. And uh, in Ezekiel there, uh, chapter uh, 14, and Isaiah chapter 28, and uh, no, I'm sorry, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, and talks about how, who Lucifer was. He was a beautiful creature, had a built-in music box in himself. That's why I believe when God kicked him out of heaven and those demons, I believe he fell right in the choir into the music department because you always have trouble with music in the church. Amen. Anyway, then he went down to the, to the nursery. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, Satan has infiltrated the human race. And so we see here how Satan came upon, the, uh, the serpent came upon this earth. Now I want to look fast forward here, and we're talking about, and I'm preaching about how Jesus dealt with the serpent uh, for us. So we've seen the beginning, we've seen the fall, we've seen the consequences, but then the next time we see and mention about a serpent is in the book of Numbers. Numbers 21, we see the second mention of a serpent. Numbers 21 verse 9 says, And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. You know, in that same story, he said, if you look and live, if they beheld that serpent, the story is that the children of Israel in the book of Numbers, they were murmuring and complaining, murmuring and complaining. They bound to have been Baptists, I'm telling you. They were murmuring and complaining, murmuring and complaining. The reason I can say that because I'm one. And, uh, and people murmur and complain all the time. It don't matter how good God is. They're going to murmur. They're going to fuss. I'm telling you. That's just the way their nature is. Maybe you need to get saved. I'm not sure. I don't know. Anyway, or get right with God. And murmur and complaining. And so God sent fiery serpents into the camp. And they would bite them. And they, and, if they, and, and, and they was dying. And Moses went to him and said, hey, what's going on here? He said, I'll tell you what. You, you make a pole. You get a pole and make a snake out of brass and I want you to put it on that pole and then when the fiery serpents come around and they bite these people if they'll behold that pole if they'll look at that pole they will live and that's where we get that word look and live if you'll look and you'll live listen the Israelites spoke against God the Lord sent those serpents and many of them died uh, while they were murmuring and complaining God told Moses to construct that brazen serpent and put it on a pole amen and I'm telling you, hearing about the snake, listen, hearing about the snake on the pole didn't do no good. Do you understand what I'm saying? A man needed to behold the situation for himself. Every man had to look himself to that pole. If he didn't, he died. If he looked and beheld, the word behold there in the, in the English language and the Greek there means to really grasp and take hold and, and examine it, not just glance over it. And that person that got bit would look at that, and they would, what they'd say is, okay, I'm going to look where Moses said. I'm going to obey, and I'm going to trust, trust and obey, and I'm going to look at that pole. And you know what? That's the same thing today. Listen, my friend, Jesus Christ had been put up on that pole. He went to the cross and he died on a tree. Amen. The Bible said, Cursed is every man that hangeth on a tree. He died the most cruel death you can do. O Roman and even the Assyrians would crucify people. It was death. It was shame to him. He was crucified naked. But I tell you one thing, if you'll look to him today, if you'll drop your pride and you'll look to him for salvation, what does that mean, preacher? That means to be deliverance from your sin and from hell. Because you know why? He got on that pole, he got on that cross, and he died for you and me. And so that's the second mention of a serpent. Now, I want to think about going fast forward and now again as we close this message, the prophecy of Jesus. Now we're talking about that he dealt with the serpent on the pole. He dealt with the serpent for us, Jesus did. He dealt it because our verse says, that God, he, for he made him to be sin for us, that who knew no sin, that we might become the righteous of God. Praise God. He became sin for us. He took our sin. The serpent is established as a symbol of sin. The serpent on the pole is a symbol of sin judged. Now, if you go to Roanoke Hospital or somewhere, I don't know if it's any other place. I'm sure on every building they have it. Do you ever went over there and you look at Roanoke Memorial and you'll see a, that looked like that flame. That was really what it is. It looked like a serpent on a pole. And uh, see, that's a symbol of healing. And uh, that's from Numbers chapter 21, verse 9. 
Uh, if you looked, you healed. If you come to that place, that's a place of healing. And uh, you know what? If we look to that figuratively and spiritually, Jesus there, he's our healing. If you'll just drop your pride and look to him, there's healing in that. And, uh, but it is a symbol that sin is judged. And you know what? Ever since Adam and Eve, there's been sin and sickness and death and suffering. Pray, I tell you what. Look and live. Look to Jesus now and live is what I'm trying to say. He took our sin for us. He dealt with that serpent for us, my friend. Here we have the heart of the gospel. Sin was judged at Calvary. When Jesus went up there, the first of the seven sayings, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh, my friend. Hey, he even, he even saved a person while he was on his deathbed up on the cross. That one guy, that one thief, it was two beside of him. One of them says, hey, Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. He said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. The other one didn't ask for forgiveness. The other one didn't know that. But one did, amen. I, I say this, one died in his sin. One died to sin. And praise God, the one in the middle died for sin, amen. And you got to look to him. Look and live, he says. Oh, my friend. Listen. Uh, God's son, his son, Jesus Christ, hung on a cross. The Bible says, and when they were come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. He was put upon that tree. Uh, we're fast forwarding and we're thinking about Numbers 21, how he told Moses to put up a serpent and put uh, that brazen serpent and put him on a pole. Now Jesus is going to take all the world's sin and all their hell and put it upon him. And God's going to judge him there. You know, one of the sayings of the cross of the seven, I mentioned to him already. You remember he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know why he said that? Because God can't look upon sin. And sin was judged by his own son. And he even had to turn his back on his only begotten son. Turn his back on him. And I tell you what, not only the physical pain that Jesus went through with the whipping post and getting uh, beat and scourged and the crown of thorns on him and then also hanging on that cross, the, the suffering there, but the spiritual agony that he went through, separation from his own father, separation from that salvation in you. And I'm telling you one thing, he, he took our hell. He dealt with the serpent for us there, the Bible says, because he became sin for us. Oh, my friend, what I tell him and thank him for all that he's done. Oh, my friend, Jesus bore our serpentine nature on the tree. See, we all needed salvation. We were all acting like the devil, the Satan, uh, the serpent. Second Corinthians 5, 21 is our verse. It says, he that knew no sin became sin for us. He didn't know no sin. He couldn't sin. It, we use a doctrinal word called impeccability. He was, he was not, he's not able to sin. He's not capable of sin. He had no sin in him. The Bible tells us that. He that knew no sin became sin for us because of our sin. Jesus became sin and God unleashed his wrath on him for us, for us. Jesus was my substitute, amen. He died as the son only. Not only that, but he died as me and for me. On the cross, Jesus was condemned by God. Jesus became what I was so I could become what he is. Amen. Satan is a defeated foe. Listen, my friend. Listen. Thank God for Calvary. And Jesus dealt with our sin in his serpent on the cross. Until next time, this is Pastor Eddie Hawks at Woodlaw Baptist Church.